All right, kiddos. How was the um, quiz online experience? No, what, why not good? Uh, bad. Why was it bad? You you will now. Now that it's done, you can go back in. And it gives you a score afterwards, so you know you got a few wrong. But now you can go back in and look at it. Yeah. Well, and see the questions and know which ones you got wrong. Huh? You're voting no? <laughs> Already? Who likes it? Oh. It's going to be close. Who doesn't like it? Oh. See, that's close. That's close. Yeah, you only get one hand's worth of vote, though. Um, we'll see. Give it a couple more, and then we'll vote again. I figure I'll, I'll put three. I'll put the first three on there to have our first test, see how it goes, and then we'll then we'll rethink the the uh, quizzes online. It saves me a lot of time. I don't have to kill trees. That's another thing. It saves a lot of paper. So, so see how it goes. Give it a chance. Give it a chance. So we left off talking about our friend, the pituitary gland. Yes? It's another name for it. Begins with an H. No hypothalamus. Hypophysis. And one of the hormones that is secreted by the adenohypophysis, which is the anterior pituitary gland, is what? Or thyrotropin releasing, TSH, thyroid stimulating. So these glands cause other glands to secrete hormones. Remember the three different ways glands could secrete their hormones? Humoral, neuronal, and from other endocrine glands or exocrine glands. So, hypothalamus, TRH, anterior pituitary gland, TSH is going to help stimulate the thyroid to release its hormone. So the next endocrine gland we're going to talk about is the thyroid. A little bit different from the other guys because what the thyroid does, and the thyroid is located in the neck, it creates its hormone and doesn't directly release it into the circulatory system. It actually puts it into a package, and from that package, the hormone is released when thyroid-stimulating hormone is secreted. So if I look at the histology of the thyroid gland, and next week you're going to have like a microscope extravaganza in lab looking at all these different um, endocrine glands, but this is the thyroid gland. And the cells that make the thyroid hormone surround the storage place for the hormone. I call this the hormone soup. So these cells are called parafollicular cells around the what? Around the follicle or space. And this pink stuff in here is actually fluid containing the hormones. What are the hormones that the thyroid makes? T3, T4, triiodothreonine, and thyroxin, T3, T4. And that's what's in the soup. So the parafollicular cells create the hormone through this process. Ooh, numbers again. Maria gets all excited when she sees numbers. What, that, what might that mean to you? This could be a possible essay question on your next exam. 
So these are the steps to the production of thyroid hormone in the thyroid gland. So T3, T4, and another one called calcitonin are the hormones produced by this particular gland. And if we look on page 608 in the textbook, we see this diagram along with the synthesis of thyroid hormones. Now, Super Bowl's coming up, and it's always nice that Super Bowl's coming up when I describe the production of thyroid hormone. In our house, we have a tradition, although it will be a sad Super Bowl for us at our home, but we still celebrate by making the lovely Super Bowl cake, which is shaped like a football, and the Super Bowl sandwich, big, large Italian bread with all the cold cuts, very good. Think about the Super Bowl sandwich when you think about thyroid hormones. So in order to produce the thyroid hormones, which are made of a couple of different components, one of the things I have to do is get some of those components into the cell so I can build the hormone. One of the very important components for building T3 and T4 is something called iodine. Why do they put iodine in salt? It doesn't naturally occur in salt, but why do you think they put it in there? So your thyroid has all those building blocks it needs to make the hormones. Our diets tend to be very low in iodine. Where might I find iodine naturally? Yes, seaweed, different fishes that we tend not to have a lot of in our diets in the United States. So many years ago they decided that since people were suffering from problems with thyroid hormone production they would actually add iodine to something that most everybody uses salt so that's why there's iodized salt some people have problems with iodine so you can buy it without right so iodine is a very important component of building t3 and t4 it floats around in the form of iodide in the circulatory system and has to be changed or oxidized so that we can use it inside the colloid to produce the hormones. The other thing I have to make is the other components of the hormones. They're called thyroglobulins. And we make those with the help of the endoplasmic reticulum. Now, what do you think a thyroglobulin is made of? Thyroglobulin. I'm, I'm taxing your brain. Chapter 2, last semester. You heard that word before, globulin, globular. What organic molecule comes to mind? Proteins. Who directs the synthesis of proteins in a cell? That's where they're built, but who gives me the directions? DNA. Remember transcription and translation? So I make that portion, the thyroglobulin portion of the T3 and T4, directed from the DNA. It's a protein. It gets put together on the ribosomes and trucked off to the endoplasmic reticulum. Then it's processed and packaged and shipped. Who's going to help me do that? Golgi apparatus to that colloid or thyroid hormone soup. So this picture, this structure is what? What's this? This is the colloid. What's this? It's a cell. What kind of cell? Begins with a P. The, yeah, that's, these are the parafollicular cells. So this is where the business end is going on. So I make my thyroglobulin and I ship it to the soup. 
it looks like those little purple logs there. And I process my iodide and oxidize it to iodine, and then I can attach that to the thyroglobulins. Now, when I make my thyroid hormone back to the Super Bowl sandwich, when you go and enjoy the Super Bowl sandwich, it would be very piggish of you to eat the whole thing, wouldn't it? So what do you have to do if you have company? You need to share. So how do you share your Super Bowl sandwich? You get a knife and you cut it up. So when I create the hormones, I'm making the Super Bowl sandwich. So I have T7s and T8s. Large molecules hang out here in the colloid. When it comes time to use or enjoy the Super Bowl sandwich or use the thyroid hormone, endocytosis and exocytosis are going to help me. So I create a little package with those big long molecules and enzymes, remember those lysosomes we talked about way back when? Enzymes are going to be like your knife to cut your sandwich. We package them up. We use the enzymes to break them down into what we need, T3 and T4, and through exocytosis, we're then going to distribute them into the circulatory system. This process takes a little bit longer to happen than normal hormone production. So that's why the thyroid is a little bit different, because it keeps producing its soup and then pulls it out and secretes it and chops it up when it's needed. Mm -hmm. There's two hormones, right? So between the two of them, they're going to help <coughs> stimulate the cells to make and stimulate the cells to release. Yes? Which one do you think helps to release? I'll give you a, a refresh your memory. Yeah, there you go. You with me? So you should understand how thyroid hormone is made. Now what's thyroid hormone for? Everything. Everything. It helps with reaction rates, metabolism. So when we look at the major effects of thyroid hormone, again T3 and T4 are good for me. You don't have to remember their big huge names. It's going to help regulate basal metabolic rate. What's that? or the rate at which chemistry takes place in your body. What are some of the things that increase chemistry reactions in your body? Temperature. temperature. Molecules move faster, they bang into each other faster. Reactions <coughs> happen at a faster rate. Eating. Why? When you eat, what do you have to do with the food that you eat? You have to break it down. You have to speed up the works, right? What else? Yeah, moving. Those are things that increase basal metabolic rate. So these hormones help to control the rate at which reactions take place. Also, carbohydrate, lipid, and protein metabolism. Breaking down <laughs> carbohydrates for energy building lipids for storage or breaking them down for energy, building proteins for structure in the body. They help to promote development in the nervous system, and they also help promote cardiovascular function. So if I have a problem with not <coughs> enough of these hormones or maybe too much of these hormones, it can cause problems, right? So hyposecretion would be what? Not enough. Hypersecretion, too much. General definition, I'm good. Yes? Any questions on thyroid hormone? 
Again, we also have muscular, skeletal, gastrointestinal, reproductive, and integumentary system being affected by these hormones. So pretty much all of the systems in the body are affected by these hormones. Too much or not enough can cause problems with metabolism. And I don't, do you have this picture? Oh yeah, there it is on page 609. These are pictures of different thyroid disorders. The little fellow in A has what we call an a goiter or enlarged thyroid. And Graves' disease. What's Graves' disease? And that causes this particular um, manifestation in people with Graves' disease. <coughs> okay? So a lot of third world countries, again, um, uh, <coughs> nutritional deficiencies can cause problems with production of thyroid hormones. All right, who's next? Oh, by the way, don't forget about calcitonin. Calcitonin is also produced by the thyroid. Um, calcitonin and bone go hand in hand. What's calcitonin doing for me? Inhibits osteoclast activity. Very good. What's that mean? opposite. Osteoclasts do what? They break the bone down. If I stop them from breaking the bone down, what can now the bone do? The bone can then take that calcium and store it in bone matrix. Okay, so it inhibits the activity and again this is the, the secondary effect of inhibiting or stimulating a hormone. If I stop somebody from doing something, somebody else can do what they were doing in the first place. In the case of osteoclasts and osteoblasts, if I stop the osteoclast from breaking down bone, the osteoblasts can continue to make matrix. Right? They're going to do that anyway. But we're going to make more matrix if I stop breaking it. So that leads into the next guy, and he's called the parathyroid gland. Now, the parathyroid gland secretes a hormone called parathyroid hormone. Thank you so much for naming it the same thing. And this guy is going to do what? And when we look, by the way, I want you, when we look at our microscope slides, we're going to see both. You see the big difference between the thyroid gland and the parathyroid? The parathyroid has lots and lots of epithelial cells packed into a nice big circle. And again, those cells are going to produce the hormones for the parathyroid gland. So we have chief cells that secrete parathyroid hormone, and then we have oxyphil cells also located in this same glandular material. Looks very different than the thyroid, doesn't it? Remember the thyroid had that ring of cells all around it and the soup in the middle? So when you look at your microscope slides, make note of the two different. So. What happens? What does the parathyroid do for me? Stimulates osteoclasts. Now remember, osteoclasts were hanging out in the circulatory system before they were osteoclasts as what? They were monocytes. And when the hormone builds up in the circulatory system, they're going to morph into osteoclasts, class breakdown. So <coughs> rising in calcium inhibits parathyroid. So if I go to Friendly's and I have one of those giant, it's called the peanut buster sundae. Anybody ever have one? It's got Reese's peanut butter stuff in there and hot fudge and ice cream and lots of calcium. So if I go and have one of those, and I increase my calcium levels a great deal in the circulatory system, the rise in calcium levels, humoral effect, is going to do what? Inhibit the release of parathyroid. 
And that's when I can build some bone. But what happens when calcium levels go down? Yeah, we're going to stop that inhibition and we're going to do what? Yeah, we're going to then stimulate those osteoclasts. Parathyroid hormone is going to help do that and it is going to break bone down. So parathyroid not only affects bone, but also has an effect on the kidneys and also has an effect on the intestines. What do the kidneys and the intestines have to do with anything? Yeah, parathyroid hormone prom promotes kidneys activation of something called vitamin D. And what the heck does that have to do with calcium? Now that's going to allow me to actually absorb calcium from the intestines. So vitamin D, without vitamin D, am I going to have efficient calcium absorption? No. So that hormone is going to stimulate vitamin D, which in turn will help me absorb calcium from the intestines. The kidneys, oh, go ahead. Yep. Yep. It's what happens to lizards. It's what happens to lizards. Yeah, if they don't get enough sunlight, they can't absorb okay. calcium, so therefore they, they create bone, bone absorption. Now, what is uh, the uh, calcium absorption? What does that have to do with sunlight? Vitamin D. Yeah, sunlight helps to activate vitamin D as well in your integumentary system. It's one of the reasons why if you don't take any supplements, the one supplement you should take living in Maine, vitamin D. Because most everybody in this classroom, if you went and got your vitamin D levels taken right now, they'd be low. How come? You don't really get out in the sun in the winter. Not that you have to go sunbathe, but sun exposure and the intensity of the sun is much lower in, in Maine in the winter. So vitamin D is a good thing to have supplemented in your diet. Um, also, kidneys. I don't want my kidneys to get rid of too much calcium if I want to keep calcium. If I want to get rid of calcium, I want the kidneys to help me get rid of extra calcium. So parathyroid hormone increases calcium reabsorption in the kidney tubules. What the heck does that mean? You know how the kidneys work? It's like a big filter. Blood flows through. At the top of the little filtering units, I'm going to suck out most of the plasma. Now, I don't really want to get rid of that. Some of that stuff I actually need. So that sucked out material then is selectively reabsorbed back into the circulatory system along the little filtering units. When we talk about the renal system, we'll talk about nephrons. And we'll see that the beginning filtering unit called the glomerulus in Bowman's capsule sucks way too much stuff out. And then the cells along the rest of the little tubes, kind of like a still, will put back into the circulatory system or reabsorb what you need. So this hormone is going to affect the reabsorption rate of calcium when it's present. So we bring back into the circulatory system more calcium than we release. So hormones, again, have a lot of secondary effects on other systems. So it's not just a bone thing, it's an intestine thing, and it's a kidney thing. And that's how they help regulate cellular function. You with me? Say yes. yes. Good. <laughs> Say something. Okay. So in your textbook, um, I, don't, I don't know why. Oh, there it is. No, that's not it. In your textbook on page 611, they talk about hypocalcemia, low blood calcium, and increased parathyroid release. Figure 16.13. I have to update my PowerPoint. I'm, I'm a slacker this semester. 
So look at that to kind of give you an idea of what um, increase parathyroid hormone does and its effects. The one I have is a little bit different that I showed you here in, the, in my PowerPoint. All right, what's this? So that's the thyroid. That's the parathyroid. So who have we covered so far? Hypothalamus. Don't forget him. Anterior and posterior pituitary. Thyroid, parathyroid. You got them on your vocabulary list, right? Good. Who's this? That's the adrenals. The adrenals sit on top of the kidneys. And the adrenals have two major parts. The adrenal gland itself consists of the outside and the inside. The inside is called the what? Medulla. And the outside is called the cortex. When you look at this guy under the microscope, you're going to have to go find the adrenals on top of a little kidney. So don't be looking at the kidney. That's not this chapter. You have to go find the gland, and it sits on top of the kidney that you'll have on your slide. <clears throat> so when you look at it under the microscope, you're going to see that the cortex has several different layers and several different types of cells that produce several different types of hormones. Aldosterone up at the top near the covering of this gland called the capsule cortisol and androgens in the central region, and epinephrine and norepinephrine down near the bottom of the adrenal cortex. They are separated into different zones or zona. So we see the top is the zona glomerulosum, the zona fasciolata, the zona reticularis, and then the adrenal medulla down here where epinephrine and norepinephrine is produced. Now, these guys have an effect on several different systems and several different hormones that are produced. When it's described in your book, they talk about the zona, and then they talk about some of the hormones in different categories. One category they discuss is something called a mineralocorticoid. And those groups of hormones, again, on one of our awesome, lovely tables, on page 616, Table 16.3 tells us what they do for a living, who they target, and what the effect of too much or too little is. So these guys are going to help regulate ion balance. Kidneys, since they happen to be sitting right on top of the kidneys, have an effect. Is that shaking or is that my imagination? Um, the kidneys are affected by many of these hormones. And when we discuss, I'm not going to get crazy about talking about it now. Basically, I want you to have a definition of these guys. When we talk about the renal system, we're going to talk in depth about something called the renin-angiotensin pathway. And these are groups of hormones that are going to help direct the kidneys on what to absorb or secrete. Remember, the kidneys are made of a whole bunch of little nephrons, giant filters. And I regulate what they get rid of and what they keep with many of the different hormones that we discuss in this chapter. Renin and angiotensin pathway is one of those. So those are produced by the adrenals. It's going to help regulate ion balance, which is another big job of the kidneys. Again, when we discuss the renal system, we're going to talk about the effects of ion balance and how the kidney plays a role in that. So that reabsorption and secretion thing I was talking about, these hormones are going to direct whether or not I secrete more ions or hold on to more ions. And water is going to be affected by that as well. Those ions have a charge, positive. Let's talk about sodium, for example. Sodium has a positive charge. Yeah, remember this chemistry stuff you thought you'd never talk about again? It's back to bite you. 
So when I absorb calcium or secrete calcium, that charged particle has followers. Do you remember when we talked about water and we talked about the fact that water was a polar molecule? Does that ring a bell? What does that mean? If I'm a polar molecule, what's that mean? Mm -hmm. You guys are good today. I can't even get a sip of coffee in. So you get a positive end and a negative end to the water molecule. Do you ever play with magnets? Opposites attract, right? So if I take a positively charged ion and I pull it through the membrane, opposites attract. So the negative end of water is going to do what? Be attracted to that positive ion and follow it. When we discuss it in the kidneys, we're going to talk about something called obligatory water secretion or reabsorption. So when I control by these hormones, a cell's ability to either secrete or hold on to an ion, I'm also controlling water balance as well because water is just automatically going to follow those charged particles. Did I confuse you? Good. No? Is it good? We're good? Okay, so that's what these guys are going to do. That's what these hormones are going to do. So the renin angiotensin aldosterone mechanism is going to have a big effect on kidneys ability to absorb and secrete water and ions. The other thing that this particular gland makes is something called ANP, atrial natriuretic peptide. Has nothing to do with the kidneys. Who's that one going to affect? Heart. The other thing that's going to help regulate water balance is pressure in your system. When I say pressure in your system, which system do you think I'm talking about? Circulatory, Circulatory system. Things want to go from a high pressure to a low pressure. Just like you. Would you rather be stressed out or sitting on the beach with a pina colada? I'm going for the pina colada. I don't know about you. So things want to go from a high pressure to a low pressure. And pressure in the system, circulatory system, is also going to affect water regulation in the kidneys. So when blood pressure is high, what, what do you think is going on inside the circulatory system? You might have too much volume in the circulatory system, or you might have too much squeeze to the tubes. There's a couple of different reasons why pressure might be high. But the quickest thing for me to lower blood pressure, the quickest thing I can do is to do what? Have a beer. <laughs> yeah, actually. <laughs> because having a beer is going to help you do what? It would decrease your blood volume. It doesn't have anything to do with AMP. It has something to do with ADH, yes? Do we talk about ADH already? Yes, we did. What's antidiuretic hormone? Oh, yeah. Helps you secrete more water, right? Would that decrease volume? Yes, it would. Who's, who's that hormone going to affect? Well, it's secreted and has an effect on kidneys but it's going to be triggered by increased pressure in the system, the heart. So the heart's going to send the message to the adrenals. Hey, pressure's high. Let's get rid of some of this volume. And AMP, atrial natriuretic peptide, is going to help secretion take place. So it's going to inhibit the hold on to everything renin-angiotensin pathway and cause us to get rid of more water. When blood volume goes down, what do I have to do? The opposite. What's the fastest thing I can do to increase blood volume? Well, what if you can't drink water? Body chemistry. 
No fruit. You can't put anything in your mouth. You have to rely on the hormones. It's the fastest way to increase blood volume. Hormones. Cells. The kidney's constantly filtering, yes? All the time. What if I tell those cells to do what? Hold on to, Hold on to more water. What's that going to do to blood volume? <coughs> increase it. Okay? So that's how we regulate pressure in the system, and that's the kidney's involvement in some of these hormones that help regulate. Does that make sense? Glucocorticoids, also discussed in your book. Cortisol, cortisone, help with lipid and lipid metabolism. They talk about something called Cushing's syndrome under homeostatic imbalances and Addison's disease. Again, regulation of these particular hormones having an effect on water balance and fat metabolism. So here's a nice table for you. Adrenal gland hormones, mineralocorticoids, glucocorticoids, gonadocorticoids. What the heck is a gonadocorticoid? Yeah. So they are also going to have an effect on reproductive organs, the hormones that are produced by the adrenals. Catecholamines. They're going to have an effect on preganglionic fibers of the sympathetic nervous system. What the heck does that mean? What's a sympathetic nervous system? Mm-hmm. Speed things up. Speed up reactions. Speed up whatever the effect is on, on um, the secretion on the cells. So here's a couple of patients. One has Cushing syndrome, and there's a very characteristic um, fat patch that we call a buffalo hump that appears on the back of a person who has this issue. Hmm? Stress. And stress is bad because stress can actually affect hormone release. Prolonged stress, and this diagram is, is perfect to show us that. Short term stress, remember, I had an effect on preganglionic fibers of the sympathetic nervous system, didn't I? Speed things up. So short term, that's good. It's going to help increase heart rate, increase blood pressure. The liver to convert glycogen to glucose. Why is that important? If I have to speed things up, what do I need more of? Energy. Make more energy because I have more glucose to do so. Dilation of bronchioles. What the heck is that doing for me? Yeah, I can get more air in. More air gives me more what? Oxygen, more oxygen gives me more energy. It's changes in blood flow patterns, all based on energy production, and help increase metabolic rate. And that's okay for short term. But what happens when this happens long term? And stress is going to cause this hormone to keep being produced and released at a higher rate. So what's going to happen long term? Yeah, pressure in the system and re because of sodium retention by the kidneys. Because the kidneys keep getting the message to hold on to more, hold on to more. And when they hold on to more sodium, they're going to hold on to more what? Water. So increased blood volume, increased blood pressure. Stress can do that to you. Proteins and fats converted to glucose or broken down for energy. And then increased blood glucose because of that and suppression of immune system because we're so busy dealing with all of this nonsense, the immune system says, hey, I'm going to take a little siesta. So stress, is it good? No. no. Relaxation techniques is one thing that all students in the sciences should practice. Yes? Do you know what I just said? Do you understand what I just said? 
you take one, and you can do this, I don't care how busy you are, you take a half an hour a day and you relax. Don't think about this class, don't think about any other class, don't think about the kids, don't think about work, don't think about the house, don't think about the car. You take 30 minutes a day to think about nothing. And the only thing you think about is breathing. Find a place, put some soft music on, light some candles, and breathe. <laughs> what? <laughs> no Vicodin, no Vicodin, no pills. You don't need it. Half an hour a day, even if it's in your car. You have to hide from the children in your car. I have done that. Oh, yeah. I've locked myself in a bathroom, too. That's been done. Oh, they'll find you. They'll beat on the door. It's like, I need two minutes so I don't kill you. And if you're a parent, you know exactly what I mean. So do that. Do that for yourself because that's going to keep you healthy. It's going to keep you sane because you're busy, and this is tough. So... You see what stress does to you. Half an hour, you can do that for yourself, right? Huh? Yeah. Exercise, though, that's a tough, you know, we keep going back and forth, and I go over this in nutrition. It's like half an hour, 45, an hour. And that. It, we, we get so boggled with the, the time that we just say, screw it, and we don't do it, right? Do what you can do. If you can do 20 minutes, do 20 minutes. But... Give yourself that half hour. I'm telling you, you will be a much happier person. Who's this? The pancreas! <clears throat> oh, so why did they skip? All right. So they talked about the adrenals, adrenal medulla. We got all that down. The next one they talk about in the book is the pineal gland. What the heck is that? The reason they call it that is because it looks like a little pine cone. Oh, it's in midbrain regions. It's hanging out around the hypothalamus and the who's the other guy in there hanging off the infundibulum, the pituitary. Correct. What do we make in the pineal gland? Melatonin. And what's melatonin do for me? It makes me sleepy. Yeah, it helps with the sleep rhythm and helps to make you sleepy. As we get older, we tend to decrease production of melatonin. Not that I have this experience of getting older, but what happens to your sleep when you get older, they say? Yeah, you don't sleep as well as you used to. When you were a teenager boy, you could sleep and there would be a nuclear bomb going off beside your head and bam, you were asleep. When you get older, it doesn't work like that anymore. And it's because you decrease production of melatonin. Um, so that's the pineal gland. Other endocrine glands, pancreas. Pancreas is important because in the pancreas, we have two groups of cells that are going to help regulate glucose levels in our body. The alpha cells produce a hormone called glucagon. And the beta cells produce a hormone called insulin. They work together to help regulate glucose levels. The pancreas is also an exocrine gland. So it's an endocrine gland, beta cells, alpha cells, secretes its hormone into the circulatory system, has its effect all over the place. But when we talk about the digestive system, we're also going to talk about its exocrine function. It also makes enzymes for the digestive process. And it secretes it out a little tube into the small intestine. That tube shares space with your gallbladder. And your gallbladder is going to secrete stuff into your digestive system to help you break down lipids. So when we talk digestive, pancreas is going to get mentioned again. 
But in this chapter, we want to talk about specifically glucagon and insulin. So, all cells need glucose. And we must maintain a plasma glucose level of between 90 and 100 so that all our cells can get all the glucose that they need. When I don't have enough glucose in the system, things start to suffer. When I don't have enough glucose in the system, I have to put more into the system as soon as I can. And that's when the alpha cells will kick in and produce glucagon and secrete it at a higher level. Glucagon is going to help me do what? It's going to increase blood sugar, glucose floating around in the plasma, by breaking down stuff that we have stored up. Where do I store glucose for a rainy day? Liver, glycogen, good, I heard it, I heard both. So glycogen, the stored form of glucose, that big huge carbohydrate molecule we talked about in chapter two last semester, we're gonna break that down when glucagon is present. That's the effect it's gonna have on my cells. I'm gonna release that glucose into the circulatory system and increase plasma glucose levels. When I go and eat that wonderful peanut butter sundae at Friendly's, along with calcium, what else am I getting? Lots of sugar, right? What's going to happen to my plasma glucose levels? Now what am I going to do? I need to store it. I need to use it. I need to store it. How am I going to store it? I got to get it into the cells, right? Insulin. Oh, I took it away. Insulin by the beta producing cells is going to be pumped out at a higher rate. And that's going to help the cells all around your body get that glucose into the cell. And that's how insulin helps to decrease plasma glucose levels of glucose. Yes? Because now I'm getting it out of the plasma and putting it into the cells. So insulin is going to help decrease glucose by sucking it into the cells and using it. Glucagon is going to increase glucose levels by breaking up the stored stuff and putting it back into the circulatory system. Yes? So this little chart on page 621 tells us um, some of the stuff that's going on with insulin deficits. So remember, I need to get this glucose into the cells so that I can use it to make my molecules. Yes? So just to double check, because I always get confused with the two. So like, if you don't eat anything at all, mm -hmm. then glucagon will like, start up because you're hungry and you need to like, increase your Correct. Blood. And then if like, like both my parents are diabetic, so like my dad takes insulin before he eats, so that's like to break down all the sugar and stuff that he's eating. That, that's where I get confused. Insulin doesn't break down sugar. It helps you absorb it. Well, that's what I meant. Like absorb it and, and then store it. Correct. Okay. And when insulin levels go up way too fast, secondary, adipose. Have you ever heard of something called the glycemic index? That's a big thing in nutrition nowadays. So foods that cause your insulin levels to go up really fast not only help you absorb the glucose into your cells, but they also help you store lots of fat. Yay. So we want to make sure we do this process, manipulate those hormones at a nice slow, even rate so they don't go skyrocketing through the roof. And again, the diabetic has a problem getting that glucose from the plasma into the cells where it's needed. So there's way too much glucose in the plasma in a diabetic, right? There's different types of diabetes, but that's kind of a common theme throughout all of them. 
The reasons for this happening are different in the different types of diabetes. Type 1 diabetes, I can't make insulin, I can't make it right. Type 2 diabetes, the receptors for insulin on my cells, they start not recognizing the insulin molecule. So I might make insulin just fine, but the receptors start saying, I oh, I changed shape just enough so we don't fit together anymore. So that's, that's some of the differences. But the end result is the same, too much glucose. Who's, gonna, who's that going to tax? Kidneys, big time. Because the kidneys are going to try to do what? You got too much glucose, what are they going to try to do? You get rid of it. And they work overtime to do that. Because your body naturally doesn't want to get rid of glucose. It wants to hold on to it. But it can only hold on to just so much. In normal urine, you shouldn't see any glucose. In a diabetic, you see glucose. How come? Your, body, your kidneys can't reabsorb all of the glucose that you have in your plasma because you have way too much plasma. Yeah, and that's, that's like end-stage diabetes because you've taxed the kidneys so much. The other thing we see is something called ketones or ketogenesis. And that's a very acidic byproduct of lipid metabolism. So that's another problem with diabetes. So another test you can do for a diabetic, a quick urine test, glucose and ketones. If we see those in the urine, we know our diabetic needs some help because they're producing way too much of this acidic byproduct from lipolysis and they have glucose in their urine, which is not normal. Okay? We good? So, on page, this is on page 619 in your textbook, figure 16.19, we look at how glycogen and glucagon and insulin and glucose relate to each other with our wonderful little negative feedback homeostasis diagram that we have 5,000 of in this textbook. Okay, so when glucose levels go up, insulin's going to kick in to bring it down. When glucose levels go down, glucagon is going to kick in to bring it up. Remember, the blood is a, is a delivery system. So it would be like me trying to go to the grocery store. If I didn't deliver enough groceries to the grocery store, the people that come to buy them would be really mad. Right? So I have to have a certain amount of groceries in my grocery store to make everybody happy. Well, I have to have a certain amount of glucose in my blood plasma to make everybody happy. So we're constantly striving to maintain that balance. Who helps me do that? The brain, the nervous system, the central nervous system. They're kind of monitoring all of this going on. The other thing they talk about is gonads and the placenta. What's a gonad? Yeah, reproductive organs in males and females and humans. They produce hormones as well to help nurture along the cells. Adipose produces hormones. And adipose tissue produces things called resistin, adiponectin, and leptins. When we talk about the digestive system and the GI tract, we're going to see a whole bunch of different hormones that help regulate the function of the digestive process. So your stomach makes hormones like gastrin. Your duodenum, which is part of your small intestine, makes intestinal gastrin. Also secretin and cholecystokinin, CCK. Um, these hormones, these groups of hormones, again, are going to help with the digestive process. And we'll talk about them in more detail when we talk about the digestive system. So what do I want you to get from this chapter? Basic definition and understanding of the hormone and what its target is and what it does. 
add it to your vocabulary list. We already talked about AMP and its effect on the which gland? That's from the heart, but who does it, who does it cause an effect on? The adrenals. Yes? Kidneys actually produce a hormone called erythropoietin. Erythropoietin, when it is released into the circulatory system, and we're going to talk about it in the next chapter, is going to stimulate hematopoietic stem cells to transform into red blood cells. So when I need more oxygen carrying capacity, like say I hear there's a sale on hermits in the, ca in the bookstore, I've used this example so many times, I must run to the bookstore to get my hermit cookies. Yes? When I run to the bookstore, what happens? Yeah, I'm going to speed things up. I'm going to use up more oxygen by running. Breathing rate's going to go up. Heart rate's going to go up. But guess what else is going to go up? Secretion of erythropoietin. Because the more red blood cells I have, the more oxygen I can carry. The more oxygen I can carry, the more cellular respiration I can do. The more cellular respiration I can do, the more ATP I can make. And then I can run to the bookstore and get my cookies. Skeleton also makes some uh, peptides that increase insulin production and sensitivity. The skin, epidermal cells, they are making precursors to vitamin D. And again, the sun and sun exposure are going to help these precursors be produced so we can activate vitamin D. So that's the skin's role in vitamin D. Thymus. We're going to learn about the thymus when we talk about the immune system this semester. The thymus is T-cell kindergarten. And this is where my cells are going to learn which cells belong to me and which cells don't belong to me. So when we talk about the T-cell, one of our lymphocytes that we're going to talk about in the next chapter, it gets its stimulation from the thymus. And the thymus and the thymus hormones, thymopoietin, thymulin, and thymosins, are going to help with that T-cell education. We good? Take out your clickers. So we're done with chapter 16. What's that mean? Did I get everybody? I got skin. I got thymus. So we have what? A quiz. Your quiz will be opening at 11 o'clock sharp today. And when is it due? Tuesday at before 9.20. Yes? So you get a little longer for this one. Nah. Oh, major difference between neurotransmitters and hormones is that hormones are secreted this don't be paranoid is your thing on you clicked it's not going to change now if you oh shoot wait a minute sorry Misty, say hi to Misty. You don't have your clicker, you're not here. You can send me an email. I'll give you a bring your clicker to every class. Nope. Register it online. And when I, your name is already in my this is how the clicker works. I put your name and that, that ID that they made you make, that's in my computer. When you click in, your, computer, your clicker is registered online, yes? When you click in, I can then merge the two. So your name will then be linked with your number, and I'll know it was you. And then it's every once in a while, the linking doesn't go too well, so I'll come to class and say, who's got clicker number, blah, 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 and you tell me, and I can go and put it in the Okay? So write me an email and tell me you were in class today, and I will beat you if you forget your clicker again.
Has everybody clicked in? All right, what's the answer? The, oh, shoot, wait a minute, go back, display. The answer is D, blood, blood. Blood is the transport system, yes? Yes, exactly. The, yeah. Let's do one more. A major determinant of a hormone's mechanism of action. How it works. Whether it works on the inside or the outside. It's a hint. Five, four, three, two, one. What's the answer? The, oops. What the heck? The answer is A. Remember, if I'm a lipid soluble hormone, I'm hydro what? Phobic. And where do I work? Directly on transcription and translation. I get into the cell, because remember the plasma membrane is also my friend, that phospholipid bilayer. But water-soluble hormones are hydrophilic, water-loving. Now, my plasma membrane is not so water-loving. Remember, my plasma membrane, that phospholipid, also has a very hydrophobic end. So I push you out. So if you want to cause something to happen inside the cell, you have to come in contact with who? the receptor on the outside. And then you're going to kick off a chain reaction. What's that general chain reaction called? Second messenger system. Yes? So know the difference between hydrophobic lipids and hydrophilic and their mechanism of action. One more? All right. Receptors for steroid hormones are commonly located Five, four, three, two. What do you think? Inside the target cell, A. Remember, those guys can get in, and then they have to get taken to their destination. Because inside the cell is a watery environment as well, right? So they get chaperoned by a protein receptor to where? To the nucleus, okay? So we good? All right, we're not done, so don't be packing up your books. I still have a half an hour of your time. And we are going to go to the next chapter, one of my favorites, Chapter 17. Oh, I use every second of my class, my friends. There is no getting out early. So chapter 17, one of my favorites, because for many years I was a lab technician. And I worked in the clinical lab in hospitals. And one of my favorite departments to work in was hematology. Love the hematology. So I get excited about this chapter, blood. Now, what is blood? First of all, what's it for? And second of all, what's it made of? Transport. So I'm going to transport a whole bunch of stuff. Everybody from chapter 16. 
I'm going to transport in blood plasma. What else is a big, huge component transport thing for blood? Yeah, but what do they transport? Respiratory gases. Why do I breathe? Because I need to get oxygen in and carbon dioxide waste product out, right? And who's going to help me transport everything in between? Blood. Specifically, the erythrocytes or red blood cells. They're just basically big bags of hemoglobin. And what they do is help transport respiratory gases. So when I look at blood proper, it's made of several different components. The largest component is plasma. 55% of your blood volume is liquid. Liquid transport medium. That's called blood plasma. If I spin your blood down in a thing called the centrifuge, all the heavy parts are going to go to the bottom. And the bottom, the heavier parts, consist of the cells that are hanging around in the circulatory system. The top liquid has no cells in it. There's a whole bunch of ions, mostly water, and we also have a whole bunch of proteins in there that are going to help transport as well. But the cellular part consists of two separate types of cells. White blood cells, red blood cells, and then we also have fragments of cells, little pieces of cells, called platelets. Most of the heavy stuff, 45% of your blood volume is erythrocytes, red blood cells, and they hang out at the bottom. In the middle, at a place called the Buffy Coat, which is about less than 1%, we're going to find the other cells, leukocytes and platelets. There's five different kinds of leukocytes that we're going to talk about in this chapter, and they do a whole bunch of different jobs for us. Never let monkeys eat bananas. Remember that. Why do I want you to remember that? That's the five different types of cells in order. That's why I want you to remember it. In order as far as numbers go. Never neutrophils. Let leukocytes. No. Leukocytes are white blood cells. Do you see what I just did? I did that on purpose, believe it or not. Because so many of you will do that. You get confused with the word leukocyte and the other type of white blood cell, which is a lymphocyte. Okay, leukocytes are all of them. Lymphocytes are a specific one. The word's really close, so be careful. So let is lymphocytes, monkeys, monocytes, eat eosinophils, bananas, basophils. So in this chapter, we're going to talk about all of them. <clears throat> but the numbers of those five guys can tell us a lot about what's going on with our patient. Because those five guys have very different and specific jobs to do throughout the body. Not all. So we're going to talk about them each separate. Promise. So leukocytes and platelets, which are fragments of a cell that are going to help with the clotting process, can be found in the Buffy coat. When we do lab for blood, we're going to take some blood, we're going to stick it in a tube, and we're going to spin it down. And we're going to actually see this. We do it in little tiny tubes called hematocrit tubes. But you can actually see the red, and then there's a little, it looks like somebody put a little dusting of white, and then plasma. So that's what blood consists of. What's it for? Transport. So it's going to help distribute things like hormones, antibodies that we'll talk about when we talk about the immune system, respiratory gases. It's going to help transport fluid, nutrients. It's going to help regulate. It's going to help regulate temperature. Is going to help regulate water balance. 
It's going to help regulate pressure in the system. So blood is a regulatory thing as well. Too much blood volume, increased pressure. Decreased blood volume, decreased pressure. Remember, movement of things is going to happen because of a couple of different factors, and one of them is pressure. Things want to go from a high pressure to a low pressure. Do they want to go from a low pressure to a high pressure? No. I don't want to leave my chair on the beach with the pina colada, right? Neither do molecules when we talk about pressure in the system. So if the pressure is too low in the system, are molecules going to go where they're supposed to go? No. Also protection. So we're going to find that it helps to prevent damage by helping to plug up holes in the circulatory system with our friends, the platelets. There's a whole bunch of different proteins in our plasma that are going to help with that process too. Normally, they're floating around in liquid form, but the platelets, when they get all activated because there's tissue damage, it'll cause those liquid proteins to change into solid. And we'll talk about that when we talk about the clotting cascade in this chapter as well. Preventing infection by delivering really, really important cells to places to help me fight infection. So when I get a cut, and we talked about this last semester in Chapter 5, when we talk about tissue repair. Phagocyte mobilization. Is that ringing a bell? Opsonization. Is that ringing a bell? Hopefully it does. Yay. Where do the phagocytes come from? The blood. OK? So blood plasma is what they talk about next. What does it consist of? Mostly water. So 90% of plasma volume is water. Because water is the perfect medium for chemistry. Water is the perfect medium for transport, right? So most of our plasma portion, 55% of blood volume, is water. The other things that are important in plasma are the things that are dissolved in water. We call those solutes, plasma proteins. About 8% we find proteins floating around, things like enzymes, antibodies, they're going to help with a whole bunch of different things that we'll discuss throughout the semester. Another really important protein, about 60% of our protein friends in the plasma, is something called albumin. Albumin is extremely important for water balance. When we hit the chapter on fluid and electrolytes, we're going to talk about osmolality and hy uh, hydro my brain just went dead. No. I, I'm, hydrophobics is the only thing in there, but that's not what it wants to say. Anyway, osmolality and water balance. And these proteins play a big role in trying to make sure that the fluid compartments throughout our body have the proper fluid amount. Have you ever seen those commercials on TV for um, third world countries, starving little kids that have those big distended abdomens? They're not fat, right? What is it? It's liquid. The reason is their proteins are in such low number. Their albumin is so low because they're malnourished. Fluid leaks out of places where it should actually be and it leaks out into the abdominal pelvic cavity. That's called ascites, and that's not normal. Albumin's going to help me keep all those fluids where they belong, inside cells, around tissues, and not leaking out in between. Globulins, alpha and beta globulin, gamma globulin, we'll talk about these guys when we talk about the immune system. They are antibodies, and they're going to help protect us from foreign substances. And then the other very important protein is fibrinogen. Fibrinogen has the ability to turn from a liquid to a solid called fibrin, 
and plug up holes in your circulatory system. So they're going to be talked about when we talk about the clotting cascade and forming a clot and the clotting process. And then we have all the other stuff, some inorganic and some uh, organic stuff. We're transporting from the digestive system all the yummy goodies that you ate for breakfast this morning. Who didn't eat breakfast this morning? Ooh. It's only two brave enough to admit it. Now, who really didn't eat breakfast this morning? Just you two? Three? Good. They're awake. We eat something already? He's sucking on a mint. All right, so that's what's being transported. The things you're digesting, those carbohydrates, those proteins, those lipids, they're being taken to where they need to go. The other very important thing to help with water balance and nerve impulses and muscle contractions are electrolytes, minerals, those are being transported. Biggie, respiratory gases. So not only are the red blood cells transporting respiratory gases, but so is the blood plasma. So when we look at levels of carbon dioxide and oxygen, we're also going to see those in blood plasma as well. And then, of course, our lovely hormones from the previous chapter. So that's what I find in blood plasma. Now we're going to talk about the heavy guys, the cells. We call them formed elements. And in lab, you are going to get up close and personal with these formed elements, not next week, but the week after, or actually, is it the week after? I can't remember. Anyway, in lab, when we cover blood, we're going to look at these guys under the microscope. And we're going to do something called a white blood cell differential. Remember the five guys I just mentioned? Well, they should be in certain numbers in your circulatory system. And you can actually go in and count them under the microscope. We're going to count 100 of them to see what numbers they're in, what percentage they are floating around in. And that's going to help us tell what's going on with our patients. The other thing we can look at is the red blood cells, which are the greatest in number of the formed elements. So when I talk about red blood cells, I'm talking about millions per cubic centimeter. How big's a cubic, no, per cubic millimeter, I'm sorry. How big's a cubic millimeter? It's very, very small. If I go get a ruler and I make a little millimeter box, about how much blood can I fit in in a little box? About a drop. So for every drop of blood, you have millions of red blood cells. And you have thousands of white blood cells. So these are some of the other guys that are part of the formed elements. There's five different kinds. And remember what we called them as collectively? Leukocytes. They consist of, and I'll show you the ones in this picture, that's a monocyte. This is a lymphocyte. Remember that one that had the word that was very close to leukocyte? And these two guys are neutrophils. The other formed element we have is that fragments of cells. And you'll understand what I mean when I talk about platelets. They're up here. So red blood cells are smaller than white blood cells, and platelets are really dinky. Yes? And when we look under the microscope, we can see all of them. These are the formed elements. So erythrocytes are different. What? Why are they different? Let's go back to this. Something's wrong with these cells. They don't have a nucleus. They are the only anucleated cell in your body. Everybody else has a nucleus, except for these guys. It had a nucleus when it was born, but before it came to be in blood, it spit out its nucleus, and when it spit out its nucleus, what happened? Whoosh. The place where that big honking nucleus was, it kind of folded on itself. So when I cut this cell sideways, it's kind of concave on both sides, caved in. Because remember, when it was born, it had a nucleus. 
But when it's in the circulatory system, no more nucleus. We, another name for these cells are biconcave discs. So if I look at them from the top, I see that little divot. It's kind of like one of those, you know, you go to the, to the sledding hill and you sit on one of those inner tubes. Except it's not open on the bottom, it's closed. But when I look, oops. But when I look at them under the microscope, it looks like there's kind of a hole there. Is there really a hole there? No, it's just because it's thinner. It's thin enough so the light passes through your compound light microscope. So that's where the nucleus used to be. When we talk about the job of the erythrocyte, it's basically a very big bag of this molecule. This molecule is hemoglobin. We talked about it way back in that chemistry chapter. The chemistry chapter is coming back to bite you this semester, isn't it? Mm. What kind of protein is it? It's a quaternary protein. Oh, you guys are so smart. And four globular protein-like portions come together to make this quaternary protein. And smack dab in the middle of all four globular portions of this molecule that make up the quaternary protein is this. This is called heme. Now do you know why we call it hemoglobin? Heme, that, with a bunch of globs, glob, globulin, or hemoglobin, excuse me, a bunch of globular proteins. So this molecule is the guy that's going to help us carry those respiratory gases we keep talking about. For each hemoglobin molecule, I have four hemes. How many respiratory molecules can I carry? Four. Notice I said respiratory molecules and not just oxygen. Because heme is not only going to carry oxygen, it's also going to carry what? Carbon dioxide. Okay? So this molecule, and sometimes I refer to it, you know, you know when you go to um, the amusement park and you go on the um, Ferris wheel? That's what hemoglobin molecules are like. That's what heme is like. So somebody's always going to be on the ride. It might be oxygen, it might be carbon dioxide. But each hemoglobin molecule can carry four. Depending on where I am, depending on what the concentration of the respiratory gases are, depending on what else? Pressure. That's going to say who's on the ride. So when we talk about the circulatory system, we talk about the capillary beds, and we talk about transport, we're going to mention pressure and why this molecule will let go of oxygen and pick up carbon dioxide or pick up carbon di uh, excuse me, drop off carbon dioxide and pick up oxygen. Where do you think these things happen opposite of each other? This molecule, where do you think it's going to pick up oxygen? Yeah, in the lungs. When you breathe in, you change the pressure in your thoracic cavity. Pressure. Oxygen, along with carbon dioxide and nitrogen and water and all that good stuff, come in air into your lungs. But the air that comes into your lungs, the oxygen is at a higher pressure than it is inside your blood. So guess where oxygen is going to want to go? From a high pressure to a low pressure. So it's going to jump on the ride. But who has to get off the ride in order for it to get on? Carbon dioxide. Why does it get off the ride in your lungs? Well, to make room, but because of the pressure gradient again. So. Carbon dioxide, when it hits your lungs and the alveoli and all the capillary beds that we're going to talk about when we talk about the respiratory system, carbon dioxide is at a higher pressure in the circulatory system than it is in the air that you breathed in. It's going to get off the ride and leave. Oxygen's going to get on. Yes? If 
If you have too much carbon, we're going to talk about that when we talk respiratory system, but too much carbon dioxide in the system will equal too much acid in the system, put you into acidosis. Not enough carbon dioxide, believe it or not, even though it's a waste product, we have to have a certain amount in our circulatory system. We'll do the opposite. Okay, so if you're hyperventilating and breathing out too much carbon dioxide, you go into something called alkalosis. And that's why, so when people are breathing, that breathing rate and the amount of uh, rest, I know I'm digressing into the respiratory system, but um, the amount of oxygen and carbon dioxide in your blood is going to help regulate your breathing rate. And when I have too much carbon dioxide in blood, my body thinks, I've got to get rid of this. So what's going to happen to your breathing rate? It's going to increase, which is kind of counterproductive because now you're making me get rid of too much carbon dioxide. So what do they do? They get, say, grab this bag and breathe into the bag. Why do you think that's going to help? You're breathing out a higher concentration of carbon dioxide than you breathed in. So if you keep breathing into the bag, eventually the air that you're breathing is going to have a higher concentration of carbon dioxide, and that's going to help regulate your breathing rate. Make sense? Very good, my friends. So do your quiz on chapter 16. Read chapter 17. Hmm, three chapters are soon to pass by. What does this mean? You have an exam coming up. So after we finish chapter 17, you're going to have an exam on chapters 15, 16, and 17. I highly suggest you start studying for that yesterday. Have a good weekend. See ya. See ya.